looked at my men and to a person, they knew we were going to die. And I was thinking, what a terrible place to die. It doesn't even have a name. Every mission that we flew, we flew with the idea that we would do whatever they needed, always. And they knew that we would do that. So they would protect us as much as they could. I was a high school All-American swimmer, and so I decided I would go to University of Indiana or to Yale to swim. And both schools offered me scholarships. And I thought, you know, that's a pretty good deal. And as my dad and I are driving back from New Haven, he said, would you ever consider West Point? I said, well, not really. I got back and my athletic director said, if you go to West Point for only one day, you will be a better person for that day. It got to a point where I got six years of schooling for four years of service, but at a rank higher than most people had. I was a first lieutenant. So that's how I got into the Army. I was drafted. I didn't have to go because I was in the National Guard in Olympia. Yeah. Uh, but I wanted to play ball, and the Army was the best place for me to play at that time. Because I was, when I graduated from high school, I was only 5'6 and weighed 145 pounds. I got assigned to the 101st. First month, I was um, assigned by the brigade commander to be a company commander with only one person in the company, me. And he said, uh, you don't know a damn thing about the Army. Sure, you're an art arranger, you're this and that, but you don't know anything. You've never been in the Army. Your father was in the Army, but you weren't. So you're going to go be a company commander, but you're going to start a company. It's going to be called Delta 3rd of the 187th. And then he started filling up the unit. And I started looking at the backgrounds of the people being assigned, and they all had stockade time. And some for not inconsequential crimes, like assault and battery, uh, grand felony theft and things like that. And apparently what the military had done is gone to the stockades and said, look, we got a company we got to fill up. If you're willing to go, we'll give you a break on what you've done. Well, everybody accepted. And then when they got there and found out it was me, who had never been to Vietnam, many of them said, I'd like to go back to the stockade. I flew uh, with uh, all of the the battalions. I supported all of them. There was eight battalions at, at that time, uh, and uh, the, there were three brigades, but we only had two lift battalions. So when the brigade would go out, uh, or one of the two of their battalions, we would end up going out too. And, uh, but the first to seventh was my, I was with the most. They got into the most trouble. Yeah, they thought they were back with Custer. And uh, they were. We were inserted in on the 16th, uh, <clears throat> immediately got engaged. And then the night of the 18th, just at dusk, I resupply. And as we were moving into the jungle, and the idea was for us to move at night, one of the I had long-range platoon assigned to me and two other units. And the, the Lerps said to me, request permission to fire. And I said, uh, for what? And he said, see women and children and men carrying water and rice. And he, he said, I don't think this is the unit, but it could be a group supplying the unit. So I'm going to just make sure. He said, three rounds, recon by fire, that's all. It was to be in the air. He fired the first round, and it was like Niagara Falls came firing back at us from all around. I said, oh, my God. 14th of November, and, uh, and we took off and went over to the border and then cut north to Duco, and we were looking for places that we could uh, land and uh, we could put the infantry in and it was big enough for us and we only uh, uh, was only going to have 16 helicopters uh, to lift the battalion instead of 20 yeah one helicopter got hit that was on the fourth lift 
I was in the first eight aircraft and I went into refueling point and refueled. So then I took off and we made our fifth lift into the landing zone. And all hell broke loose. Uh, I had the D Company commander and his uh, artu uh, mortar platoon leader. And uh, when we came in, they both got wounded. Uh, their radio operator got killed. My crew chief got shot through the throat. And when I came out, I had three dead and three wounded on the aircraft. I'm not sure where the hell they came from, but I think that they had wounded, they loaded on uh, from one side. Well, well, uh, we were uh, getting other guys off the other side. And I reinforced the front unit that was pinned down by, the citation says a bunker, but it, there was a bunker there, but that's not, there was a guy in a tree. They called it the Y of a tree, and he was shooting down on the men and then people shooting this way so that the men couldn't rise up to shoot him. And my medic said, sir, this is now my time. And he left. And he'd never said that to me. He always said, gotta go, see you in a little bit. Gotta go, be back in 10. Gotta go, always would be back. And he said, this is my time. And he lost his life giving tracheotomies to four alert people in front of this bunker. And another sergeant, I called over, I said, Roy, take your machine gun and take the flank over there. There's something going on. And he, he too would always say, got it, sir. What are we doing tonight? What are we doing? Just kind of joking around. He said, got it, sir, and saluted and went. And he lost his life. Uh, and then I said, I gotta go find out what's going on. So I went up forward with my RTO. I said, you stay here, I'm gonna go in there. And this why of the tree, everybody telling me that I saw it and the guy and I just threw every hand grenade I could get to make sure there's no more tree. So I told my RTO, okay, I'm done up here and let's go, we've covered this. And then I heard this massive explosion from my back right rear where the platoon had started carrying the wounded back to be medevac. I got a call from the lieutenant, and he said, I'm hit. I think we've lost three or four more. I don't know where we can go without risking everybody. And I said, I'll be back to you. And I looked at the map, saw where they were, and said, uh, I got the, I called him back, and his radio telephone operator, his RTO answered, Calvin Heath. I said, Calvin, turn off your radio and tell everybody to feign death. I'll see you in the morning. We had to stay on the ground, my helicopter, uh, while they un got the radio away from that, uh, the dead radio operator, and it was in the middle, still sitting in his seat. And uh, the D Company commander and the, and the uh, mortar platoon leader got off after they got the radio away from him. But they'd been wounded while they were still on the, on the bird. And to a lift later, I took them back out because they'd been hit again. They both were, were wounded again and, and we carried them out. And I think Metzger got killed at that time when uh, he was putting the D Company commander on the aircraft and he was already wounded and he got hit from, from the backside. And then I kept getting contact by people in the air. Here's what we know, here's what we can do. And the brigade commander said, I'm gonna send a company to reinforce you. I said, it's too dangerous. We, we gotta do this alone. And he said, you really think that? I said, I know that. Because I can hear them talking, I know where they are. The weapons they're firing are not from a small unit, they're huge weapons. And they're engaging the damn fighter aircraft that are coming over. And I said, this is, this is bizarre. I said, I think I've got it, but I said, just get me some air support. And he did. We just kept going until morning. Eventually, helicopters took all the kill out. Every one of those guys was there to protect the other guys. And they were my sons. They were my, my men, were my sons. And I don't care if they were not in my unit. They were mine. The relationships that you have in a, in a combat situation is just, uh, 
it's better than any other relationship you'll ever have, ever. The lesson that I've learned is we have to be very careful allowing other people to judge people before we meet them. Among these criminals, as they were known, or the, their official title that the Chicago Sun-Times assigned them were the clerks and the jerks. And they were so proud of that. Uh, they went on to prove that no matter what anybody else said, they were beyond better in everybody else's estimate. And that in the face of extreme stress, it's unbelievable what a human being can do. To this day, now that I have the, the award, that's a tremendous honor, but it doesn't belong to me. And it's uh, the greatest honor was being able to lead those troops and, and, and support the troops that I, that I wasn't leading, the ones that, that expected so much from us and that we expected so much from us too. And the medal, uh, the men wrote that up, it's not me. And it's not just them, I'm part of them. Until the day we all die, we're part of each other.